grab a Bible, Ephesians chapter 1. If you have a smartphone or a tablet, you can follow along, Ephesians chapter 1, or we'll also have the scripture up on the screens. This is one of those passages we're going to read today that it's actually a prayer. Has anybody ever asked you this question, how can I pray for you? Have you ever had anybody raise your hand, ask you that question, how can I pray for you? Okay, so someone said, how can I pray for you? What did you say in response? Give me a few examples of what you said. Guidance. Guidance. Wisdom, health. What else? Strength. Strength. Courage. So so there's these lists of things that maybe somebody said, hey, how can I pray for you? And and we said, hey, here's some very practical things that, that I would like you to pray for me. But I wonder, has there ever been a moment where you didn't know what to pray for somebody, but you thought maybe I should be praying? Maybe it's your children You thought, I I should be praying for my kids, but the truth is, I don't even know what to pray. Or maybe it's a circumstance in life that's got you confused, and you're like, I don't even have a clue what to ask for in a moment like this. 2,000 years ago, the Apostle Paul wrote this letter, or or maybe he said it out loud, because remember, he's in prison. He's chained up to guards. Maybe somebody else actually wrote the words down on paper, but he wrote this prayer. 2,000 years ago, and it is just as appropriate today for us to hear, for us to receive, and for us to pray for others and for ourselves as it was 2,000 years ago. So Ephesians chapter 1, uh, verse 15, I want to read this passage and you'll see there's four things, four aspects to this prayer that just if we could experience today would change our lives. Here's what Paul says, for this reason... Ever since I heard about your faith in the Lord Jesus and your love for all of God's people. Two things that that set uh, these people he's talking to apart. Number one, faith in the Lord Jesus. Number two, love for all of God's people. These two characteristics set the recipients of his letter apart. Faith in Jesus, love for all of God's people. Look what he says though. I have not stopped giving thanks for you, remembering you in my prayers. I keep asking. He's over and over again pleading. I keep asking that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the glorious Father, may give you the spirit of wisdom and revelation so that you may know him better. I pray that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened in order that you may know the hope to which he has called you, the riches of his glorious inheritance in his holy people and his incomparably great power for us who believe. That power is the same as the mighty strength he exerted when he raised Christ from the dead and seated him at his right hand in the heavenly realms, far above all rule and authority, power and dominion, and every name that is invoked, not only in the present age, but also in the one to come. And God placed all things under his feet and appointed him to be the head over everything for the church, which is his body, the fullness of him who fills everything in every way. In this passage, there's four prayers that that Paul is saying, I believe even for a a, a day like today, this is what I'm praying that you would get. Number one, there's a prayer for knowledge. A prayer for knowledge. See, here's the interesting thing. We don't figure God out. We don't solve the mystery of who God is and like a light bulb goes off and we're like, oh, that's who God is. Now it all makes sense. Actually what happens is God reveals himself. God wants us to know him. He's not like a puzzle saying, I hope you can get the pieces in order and then you'll figure me out. He's not hiding and we're supposed to be seeking. God is saying, I want you to know me. I want you to know me. I want you to know truth. I want you to trust me. I want you to trust I don't change. Scripture says God was the same yesterday. He's the same today. He'll be the same forever. And we can know God. But in our culture, uh, in the last almost century or so, things have been starting to erode this kind of trust. Uh, You've heard of postmodernism, and it ushered in this new era of skepticism and distrust and is objective reality and absolute truth even even real anymore, or was that old-fashioned a thing of the past? But then last year, this new word popped on the scene. Somebody made it up. Somebody came up with this idea. Oxford Dictionary uh, said that 2016, the year of the word, was post... Anybody know? Truth. Post-truth. Post-truth is this new idea that is out there. The BBC, I found an article that said this. Post-truth is this idea. 
objective facts are less influential in shaping public opinion and appeals than are emotion and personal belief. The whole post-truth phenomenon is about this. My opinion is worth more than the facts. It's how I feel about things that really matters. Did you get that? My opinion and how I feel rule the day. And that's how we should live our lives. Except that, what if my opinion is different than your opinion? Or your opinion? Or your opinion? Or your opinion? Or you? how, what if I feel differently about something than you do? Or you? Or you? Then, then how do we decide? How do we know? How do we make sense? Here's what Paul says 2,000 years ago, just as appropriate today. He says this. Read it one more time in verse 17. I keep asking that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the glorious Father, may give you the spirit of wisdom and revelation. That there is a gift that God has for us. It's the gift of wisdom. It's the gift of revelation. It's the gift of his spirit. It's the gift of truth, of knowing. And truth starts with God. Truth and, and knowing begins with God and God saying, I want you to know me. Like, I want you to know me and who I am. So God has taken the initiative to reveal himself. But look what he says, that he would give you the spirit of wisdom and revelation so that, that's a purposeful clause. Here's the purpose, so that you may know him better and better and better. Some of us in this place today may say, I don't even know God. And here's the reality. But God knows you and he desperately wants you to know him. Others of us may say, uh, there was a time when I knew God. There was a time when God would speak to me, but I just don't hear God like I used to. I, I, I don't experience God like I used to. And Paul's prayer is this, that you would know God better and better. And it's not a list of facts. It's not um, this, if I know these five things, I know these ten things, then I know God. It's not knowing about God. It's actually know God. This word know is used in different places in the Bible um, as a euphemism for the relationships between a man and a woman, a, a, a husband and a wife, if you know what I mean. So Paul is saying, I pray that you would know relationally, intimately, personally, this God who knows you. That God would reveal himself to you so that you could know him. But see, this is the story of Scripture from beginning to end of God seeking people to say, I know you and I want you to know me. He came to Abraham in chapter 12 and he said, Abraham, I, I, I know you. I want to bless you. And if you'll let me bless you in the way that only God can bless, Abraham, you will be a blessing to this world. Just a couple of chapters later, Genesis chapter 16, there's a woman named Hagar. I'll make a big story short. Uh, and Hagar is on the run because she feels like she's been overlooked. She feels like everybody has turned their back on her. She feels like nobody cares for her anymore. She's just going to run away to try to escape. As she's running away, an angel of the Lord comes and says, God sees you. God knows you. God understands everything that's going on. And Hagar has this turning point kind of moment in her life where she says, I have finally seen the God who sees me. And this changes everything because she's not alone. She's not forgotten. She is known by God. She actually gives a name to God and it's in the Bible. Isn't that crazy? Like she gave a name to God. She called him El Roy. Now I am from the South. We like to put things like that together and just call him El Roy. But it's El, the God, Roy, who sees. She says, you are the God who sees. And now I have seen you. Because God wants us to see him. God shows to Moses and in the form of a burning bush. and says, Moses, take your sandals off. The place you're standing is holy ground. And God reveals himself to Moses. That's why 17 people would load up on an airplane tomorrow, fly all the way to India, because there's a nation, there's a, there's a, a people who in their nation worship 330 million gods. How do you even keep track of all those gods? 330 million gods, but yet they're coming to say, but, but there's a God of the Bible who knows you and wants you to know him, and his name is Jesus. 
And Paul is saying, I want you to know this Jesus. And the, the reason we know God wants us to know Jesus is we're told that God, God demonstrates his own love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. God sent Jesus on a rescue mission so that we could know God. This is big stuff. And Paul is saying, I pray that you would know this God deeply and fully and completely. And when you do, it makes all the difference because we can't really know ourselves without knowing God. We can't really know and understand our lives without knowing God. But when we know God, all of the wisdom and the revelation of the Spirit of God is there to lead and guide and direct and fill us up. So Paul prays that we would have knowledge of who this God is and we would grow and grow in this knowledge. It speaks of a lifelong adventure with Christ. Number one, a prayer for knowledge. Number two, a prayer for hope. A prayer for hope. Let's talk first about what hope is. See, hope, when we use the word, often means like wishful thinking, like I hope the cowboys win. And I talked smack last week, and they blew it, and they disappointed me. And now some of you are like, I hope the Steelers win. I hope the Patriots win. I hope the Hawks win. I hope, who's the other team? (laughs) Oh, Packers. I hope the Packers win. I hope the traffic's not bad. I I hope the Lakers figure it out. I, I hope all these kind of things. They're wishful thinking about now, about circumstances. Biblically, hope is always in the future. It's a future reality that informs how we live today. Biblically, hope is always knowing that there's actually another part of the story. There's a future part of the story that, that's probably not the end. It's a new beginning. But the future part of the story is about, <clears throat> about a God who restores all things, makes all things new. He wipes away all tears. He takes away all death. He makes right. He justifies every injustice. There's coming a day, and it's hopeful, fullness of hope in the future and that future informs right now that reality gives us confidence today uh, an ability to say "I i have hope hope's not a feeling you don't feel biblical hope hope's not a circumstance if everything's fixed then i'll have hope hope is a future reality that invades my life no matter how I feel or no matter the circumstance I find myself in. It's a new reality where God says, no matter what is going on, you can have hope. You can trust. You can know that that God is faithful. 2 Corinthians chapter 4, Paul talks about this idea of a hope. In, In verse 16, here's what the Apostle Paul writes. Therefore, we do not lose heart. Losing heart is what happens when despair comes in, when hopelessness invades. Therefore, we do not lose heart. Though outwardly we are wasting away, yet inwardly we are being renewed day by day. For our light and momentary troubles, light and momentary, but you say that this is hard. This isn't light or momentary. This is hard what I'm going through. And Paul says, I get it. I get it. But in the grand scheme of eternity, it may be light and momentary. Our light and momentary troubles are achieving for us an eternal glory that far outweighs them all. So we fix our eyes not on what is seen, but on what is unseen. Since what is seen is temporary, but what is unseen is eternal. Paul says there's something beyond now that's then, but then informs now. And it gives light and confidence and hope now. Are there any moms or dads in the room? Raise your hand high. Be proud. All right. You, if this is true, keep your hands up. Like somebody who's been around a labor and delivery room. Anybody? All right. So, so you know what that's like. When I was like 26 years old, my first time ever entering like personally into the labor and delivery room, I, was, I married my wife. She was a labor and delivery nurse. But it was different when it was personal and you're going to have your own child or she's going to have your own child. You know what I'm talking about? So... We get there, and because she's a labor and delivery nurse, she had our first baby at the hospital where she works. So she just sort of walked in and starts strapping herself up to machines. She's like, I got this. I'll call you when I need you. We're good. But then labor started happening, and my beautiful, peaceful, tranquil, laid-back wife 
became something altogether different. <laughs> and she's like, oh, and she's like, you did this to me. Now, okay, let me say this first before I finish my story. I have a bad memory, so sometimes it's like, this is my version of how things happen. So if you talk to my wife about this, she may give you a different side of the story. This is my version of how things happen. She hurt, she was in pain, she was in agony, she blamed me. Look what you did to me! And I'm flipping out, like, what is going on with this woman? What have I done to her? Like, I was starting to take it personally, like, I'm so sorry I did this to you. And I'm telling the, the, the nurses, like, she's not usually like this. I don't know what's going on. And, and, like, there's this moment where it's like, this is terrible, this is terrible, this is terrible. And then all of a sudden, she holds this baby, and she's like, this is wonderful, this is wonderful, this is wonderful. And I'm like, I'm even more confused. What do I do? I don't even know how to respond to you, woman. And then about 19 months later, we came back for a second child. And the same thing started happening. She's like, oh, it's your fault. I'm so mad at you. But guess what? I'd been there, done that before. So I looked at the nurses and I'm like, no problem. She's going to be good. Don't worry about it. She just gets this way sometimes. You know what I mean? And I'm like, this is fine. Then uh, like... 20 months later, we went and we did it again. And, and this time, I'm like ordering pizza and watching the game. I'm like, she's fine. Don't worry about her. Because, see, we had this picture. We'd experienced it. We'd understood that there was agony, there was pain. And yes, it was for a moment. But moms, you know this. You go through that for two or three or 25 hours. And it's terrible. And then all of a sudden, it's all redeemed in an instant. And it's beautiful. And Paul says there's pain, there's agony, and he does equate it to even labor pains. But he says, but then there's this other part of the story that makes the pain bearable because it brings hope. And Paul is saying, I pray that all of you have the kind of hope that helps you endure. The kind of hope that will help you keep going even when life is hard, even when life doesn't make sense. I pray that you have the kind of hope that fills you with confidence now that it's going to be okay, that God is still in control, and you can trust him and know. So Paul prays that we would have knowledge. Paul prays that we would have hope. Third, Paul prays that we would have riches. And now some of you are like, yeah, it's about time. You're like, Paul, here it is, riches, time. I'm so good. Um, but I don't think Paul here is talking about the kind of riches where we start praying for that new car that bigger house. If you were to think about this, like how do we define riches? We probably do it in monetary and materialistic kind of ways. If Paul's audience would have described what riches were like, they would have said, like you're rich if you have a lot of livestock. Any, any people with a lot of livestock? Not necessarily, probably. Paul said we probably would define it back in that day in terms of like houses. So there's one way we would. Paul would probably say we do it in terms of like food because they didn't have refrigeration. So like wealth was shown when somebody came over for dinner and you had like an elaborate spread because it was all fresh. So that was a way of showing wealth. But because they didn't have refrigeration, guess what? That rich, that kind of riches fades away. It rots. It spoils very, very quickly. So Paul says, I'm praying that you would understand the riches, the inheritance that you have that is more than anything on this earth can give you. But Peter picks this idea up in 1 Peter, and it's in your sermon notes. It's on our app. Read it sometime later. It, Peter's words are amazing. He says that God has this great mercy. He's given us a living hope into the resurrection of Jesus, into an inheritance, into an inheritance, riches, that can never perish, spoil, or fade. The kind of riches that don't rot, the kind of riches that don't fade. Like you get a new car, it's not new for long. It's not perfect for long. In a couple of months or years or whatever, you're going to need another new one to replace that. If it's that kind of riches you're living for. Peter and Paul are both saying there's a kind of riches, a kind of inheritance that doesn't grow old. It doesn't fade away. That God has this kind of new riches. And, and, and in that passage, Peter says, because your faith... Faith in God is worth more than gold. It's true in lasting riches. It lasts forever. And Paul is praying that you would understand, that I would understand what true 
riches, true treasure is like, and it's found in Christ. Fourth, the fourth prayer Paul prays for us is a prayer for power. So there's knowledge, there's hope, there's riches, and now there's power. And this, this idea that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened, that you would know, verse 19, his incomparably great power for us who believe. There's that turning point. For us who believe, we read that last week in verse 13, there was a turning point. When you believed, Paul says, here's the incomparably great power for us who believe. That power is the, what's the word? It's the same. Hold on to that. That power is the same as the mighty strength he exerted when he raised Christ from the dead and seated him at his right hand in the heavenly realms. Does that make you say, Paul, what are you talking about? Paul is praying that we would have the kind of power that is the same power that raised Jesus from the dead, that 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 power could be ours. Now, if riches isn't about getting a newer car or a bigger home, then power can't simply be about, then I get my way and I'm in control. It's got to be something more than that. It's got to be that God wants to give us knowledge and hope and riches and power, not so that we can get our way, but that we can live the life he's created us to live. And here's what's so amazing to me. We think we're dreaming of the best life possible. We think if our dreams would come true, we would have all that we imagine. But in Ephesians chapter 3, Paul says, God is able to do for your life more than you could ask or imagine. That that God actually wants to give you life beyond your wildest dreams. He wants to give you peace and hope and power and riches beyond anything you're dreaming about. And here's what Paul says, and this is his own words. God's incomparably great power is the same power that rose Jesus from the dead. And that's for us today. So there's this line in there that that applies really to these last three prayers where Paul says, I pray that your eyes would be enlightened, that you would understand. It's this idea that we would be able to have spiritual eyesight to see correctly, that we would be able to trust fully, that we would be able to experience this life that that God has created us to live. And Paul says, I I pray that you would have power, and power is one of those great themes of Ephesians, and, and I think it's great because fear is probably only really overcome by power. Worry is probably only really overcome by a new kind of power in our lives. So, If I were to ask you, are you powerful? Like, do you feel strong? Uh, You would have to answer it by one of just a couple of ways. First, you would look inwardly at yourself and say, am I strong? Can I do this? Do I have what it takes? Or you would look at your circumstance and say, I don't know. Am I strong? Do I have resources? Do I have opportunities? Or there's a third way, and this is Paul's way, and he says, or you could look at Christ and say, what kind of strength does God have for us in Christ? And that is what defines how I have strength and ability to to persevere, to endure, to keep going through this life. 2 Corinthians chapter 12, Paul says this. He's got this issue in his life. And we don't know what it is, but it's something that he's praying about. Basically, God, would you help? God, would you take it away? God, would you deliver? He prays this. And he prays this. And he prays this. And it just doesn't seem like God is listening. And he prays this, but then in verse 9, he writes, but. So obviously, he's probably not going to get what he's asking for. But he, God, said to me, Paul, but God said, My grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. Therefore, I will boast all the more gladly about my weaknesses, so that, here's that 
uh, purposeful clause, so that Christ's power may rest on me. That, that phrase rest literally means to be possessed. It means to be filled up. It means to be empowered. So he says, I'm going to boast in my weaknesses. I'm going to boast in those hard times. I'm going to boast in those things when it's not going my way so that Christ's power can rest on me. That is why, for Christ's sake, I delight in weaknesses, in insults, in hardships, in persecutions, in difficulties. For when I am weak, then I am, what's the word? Strong. But we think, no, but it's a feeling, right? I've got to feel that. Or it's a circumstance. I've got to have that circumstance. Those resources. And Paul says, no, no, no. I'm praying that you would have power. And it's more than you can offer. And it's more than your circumstances can offer. It's the kind of power that it doesn't matter what's going on in your life. You can still have strength. No matter what you face, no matter what's against you, that God's power can become your reality. It's not about you. It's not about what you can do. It's about what God has already done for us in Christ. And God says, here is my gift, if you want it. You can know me. You can know me and you can have this new relationship. You can have hope no matter what happens in your life. You can have the true riches that could never be taken away, that won't spoil or perish or fade. You can have a power, a strength, not to do whatever you want to do. That's not what life is all about. It's better than that. You can have the power, the strength to live the life that God is inviting you to live. And it's better than you're asking. It's better than you're dreaming. It's better than you are imagining. So we pray, God, would you open up our eyes of understanding so that we can know you, so that we can have hope in you, so that we can know the reality of the riches given, so that we can know the power we've been given. Because the problem is this. Some of us say, but if I'm honest, my life is so marked by fear. My life is so marked by worry. The same power that raised Jesus from the grave can lift you out of your fear and deliver you from your worry. Do you believe that? The same power. If worry has your heart, the same power that broke the chains of death around Jesus can break the chains of you. The same power that has set Jesus free can deliver you from your habit, your hurt, your hang-up that has held you back for far too long, the same power is yours. You may say, but I thought my best days were behind me. The same power that came, not after one day, not after two days, after three days where it seemed like it was too late and all hope was gone, and Jesus was raised to say, your best days aren't behind you. I'm just getting started. It's the same power. You, You thought, I was ready to give up. I was all alone, the same power that at the darkest moment entered into a tomb, brought life back into Jesus, enters in our dark moments, enters into our we're all alone kind of moments. The same life-giving power, the same hope-filling power, the same chain-breaking power, the same leading, guiding, delivering power that did all of this for Jesus is for you and for me today. Do you want that kind of power or do you want your strength? And so Paul says this, Start praying that. Start believing that. Start living into that. You, you, you have children? Don't just pray that they have a good day at school. Pray that their eyes of understanding would be open, that they would understand the hope that God has called them to. That's a little bit better prayer than my words can come up with. Start living into this and saying, God, I want this to be true for my life. Prayers of knowledge, prayers of hope, prayers of riches, prayers of power. God, may it be true of us today.